Okay, so this is your best worst decision ever, or a presentation on the duality of your decision. Now I say, when giving a presentation, you want to start with the bad news first and then end on a positive note, so I guarantee you that's what I'm going to do tonight. Uh, my presentation's in two parts. The first part is a discussion of how much the odds are stacked against non-traditional students. That's an unfortunate fact, but true. Uh, the second part then goes into why this decision is the best decision that you can make. Now, let's get into the first part, which is a bit of a downer, and I call your worst decision ever, or why your friends and family think you're crazy. In this section, I'll be throwing a lot of financial numbers and statistics at you. Uh, so if you're smart, you're going to take this with a grain of salt, because as you recall, there's three kinds of lies. There's lies, there's damn lies, and of course, there's statistics. Now, we think Mark Twain was the originator of that quote. However, just as a quick aside, uh, he actually attributed it to uh, Benjamin Disraeli, uh, who was a UK Prime Minister in the late 19th century. And I don't know how well this uh, picture is coming up on your screen, but he kind of looks like a pissed off Jeffrey Rush. Well, let's talk about the first strike against the non-traditional student, and that's undergraduate graduation rates. Now, before I get into more detail, let me define what I mean when we use the term non-traditional student. A non-traditional student is somebody who meets one of seven criteria. They either, one, and this is pretty obvious, uh, are delayed in their enrollment to college. Two, uh, they may have part-time attendance. A third criteria is they're financially independent, usually from their parents. Fourth, they work full-time. Five, they have a dependent other than their spouse. Six, they may be a single parent. Or criteria seven is that they have obtained a non-standard high school diploma, which is basically a GED. So our timeline, uh, or I'm sorry, our baseline here is the traditional student uh, being somebody right out of high school. Now, you can see right there, somebody coming right out of high school has a graduation rate of about 64%. Now let's take somebody who has just one criteria of being a non-traditional student. Let's say they were in the military and got out after a couple of years and then they decided to attend college. Well, they are now what we would consider a minimal non-traditional student. Let's assume they have no other non-traditional factors. Their graduation rate goes down by about 10% to 52%. So they now have roughly a 50-50 chance of graduating just by delaying their entry uh, from high school into college. Let's take somebody now who has two or three of those seven criteria that I mentioned. Their chance of graduation goes down to 41%. And last, let's get somebody who we could, would consider uh, significantly non-traditional. That's somebody who has four or more criteria. Let's say a single mom uh, who has uh, uh, one or two kids, is working uh, full-time and going to school part-time. Unfortunately, her chance of graduation is a dismal 33%. That's a one in three chance of graduation, and that's not very good odds. And you can see down there at the bottom where these uh, numbers come from. Now, of course, if you're Han Solo, you would say, never tell me the odds. Okay, so if that last statistic was not bad enough, let's take a look at this equation. This equation is the Gumpert's Makem Law of Mortality, which is basically calculus applied to probability and statistics. It lets statisticians know or determine uh, what your chance of dying is at any moment in time. It's basically your lifespan. So let's plot that out. The mean lifespan for an American born over the last 40 years or so is roughly about 82 years old. Let's give that a standard deviation, uh, which then allows us to safely say your lifespan's probably going to be somewhere between 67 years, it's about 97 years. Obviously, we all hope that we're on the 97-year side, but uh, I tell you what, uh, if you'll indulge me and you'll indulge Murphy's Law, uh, we'll say you only make it to 67 years old, and I'm sorry about that. Now, it, just as a quick aside, 
I, I don't know if you're interested or not, but I'm going to tell you anyways. Uh, Murphy's Law was uh, actually originally coined by a U.S. Air Force flight surgeon, Dr. Stapp, who used to work on those rocket sled programs that you, you can see uh, on YouTube from the late 1940s. Um, he was once asked at a, a news conference, how come his team was so successful with the research and how come they never had any fatalities? And he answered the reason was because Edward Murphy built the sensors for his program and they were notorious for always breaking. So they always assumed that his sensors would break and they planned for that. Then that's where we got Murphy's Law from. But well, anyways, let's take a hypothetical 30-year-old uh, individual who's decided that uh, he or she wants to become a doctor. Now let's assume that it takes them four years to do their undergraduate requirements. Let's say they had some uh, in the bag, but they needed to get the rest uh, so they could kind of get into uh, medical school. And it takes them roughly four years of undergraduate uh, school to complete. And then they do another four years in medical school, so they graduate at around age 38. Let's say they do one of the shorter uh, residency programs, uh, uh, emergency medicine, family medicine, internal medicine, and they're able to graduate uh, from residency program in three years. So that puts them at roughly age 41. So let's take from age 41 to the end of their lifespan, which we're going to go with 67 years. That gives them a 26-year period to practice before they kick the bucket. It doesn't sound uh, too bad, 26 years for the amount of work they put in. That seems okay. Let's take that same equation and let's push that another 10 years. So we're going to say that age 40, they decide they want to go to medical school. They complete their undergraduate and they complete their uh, medical school by age 48. And then they complete their residency by age 40 or 51. And that gives them a little bow tie there of 16 years uh, to practice medicine. So you have to ask yourself, is it really worth going through 11 years of undergraduate medical school residency just to practice for 16 years? I'm not sure it's worth it, but like the oracle from Matrix says, you don't believe any of this fake crap anyways. You're in control of your own life, remember? So hopefully, hopefully I haven't depressed you too much yet. Um, just in case I haven't, let me go a little bit further and we're going to talk about uh, student loan debt. So in the 2013 Student Doctor Network Annual Member Survey, 55% of students reported having some undergraduate debt. Those numbers broke out like this. 26% had greater than $40,000 in debt. 35% had 20 to 40,000. And the remaining 39% had less than 20,000 in debt. The mean medical school debt is roughly 100, I'm sorry, the mean undergraduate debt is roughly about uh, $26,000. Now those numbers change a lot when we get to medical school. Our survey shows that 85% of medical students take out student loans in medical school. Those numbers then break down like this. 37% have greater than $200,000 in loans. 13% have 150 to 200. 16% have 100 to 150, 12% have 50 to 100, and 22% have less than $50,000 in loans. Now again, I'm just talking about medical student loans here. So the mean medical school debt is about $140,000. Let's take then the $26,000 that we had from undergraduate, and that gives us a mean total debt of about $166,000. Now remember this number because I'm going to be using it again. So there's three major ways that you can pay back your student loans. There's standard repayment program, meaning that as soon as you graduate from medical school, you start paying back your loans at a flat monthly amount every month. That looks something like this. The next one is income-based. And so for the first... Uh, three years once you graduate from medical school, let's say first three years you're doing, again, we're in the internal medicine, emergency medicine, family medicine, the shorter residency program, let's say they do three years and uh, they pay a lower amount during residency, then it gradually increases during their first few years of practice and eventually settles out at a flat amount. 
it takes longer, usually around uh, 15 years, so there's uh, certainly more interest accrued. You can see certainly that there's more there than there was in the uh, shorter loan repayment program. And then there's the last option, and what I consider to be the worst one, and trust me, I speak from experience, and that's the extended program. So for the first three years, your loans are basically def deferred, those three years that were in the uh, uh, residency program. And then it goes up to a flat amount that's lower than the other ones and continuous then for the next 25 years. So as you can imagine, the amount of interest that accrues on that is pretty significant. So let's take these numbers. I'm going to take out the 166, the principal amount, and we'll take a look at the amount of interest on each of these. So the first case, $105,000 in interest. Next one is 151. And that last one is $306,000 just in interest. You basically just tripled the amount of your loan. I definitely do not recommend that one. Avoid it at all costs. The one that I do recommend would be income-based, uh, if you were to ask my opinion. So let's talk about earning potential. Now, there's an interesting case study that I saw uh, discussed on erdoctor.com a couple of years ago, and I've taken that and expanded, on, expanded it uh, just a bit. What I'm going to do is compare three individuals, a specialist, primary care doc, and you can tell they're a primary care doc because they're losing their hair, and then the UPS guy. In the first scenario, the specialist, uh, what we're going to do, let me back up just a bit, um, I'm going to start them all, all three of these folks at day zero, and we're going to use numbers uh, from the 2012 Medscape Annual Survey of Physician Income. So day zero on this graph here, uh, it's going to be the day they decided to become a doctor or the day they decided to become a UPS guy. In the first scenario, our specialist, she spends eight years in college and then medical school. So four years college, four years medical school, which is a total of eight years. She then does a minimum of four years specialty residency. Uh, during that time, she's making roughly around $50,000 a year. And then she graduates and she goes into a nice job making $280,000 a year. Now let's take a look at the primary care doc. Similar, similar thing, four years undergraduate, four years medical school, three years residency, and then they're making 160 a year on average thereafter. And last, we're going to take a look at the UPS guy. Now the UPS guy, he didn't have to go to college. He didn't have to go to medical school, so he starts right out at $40,000 a year. And I've taken these numbers from uh, uh, colleagues and, and friends that uh, uh, I know who work at UPS. And they tell me these numbers are valid. So it, it starts out around 40,000, and then if they, uh, you know, really work uh, over a period of time, they will gradually increase uh, up to about $100,000. Now let's take a look at this in another way. Uh, let's take those annual income numbers and build them over a 20-year period. At the end of the 20 years, specialist has earned $2.4 million. Primary care doc has earned $1.6 million. And the UPS guy has earned, guess what, <laughs> $1.6 million. That's right. The UPS guy, because he's able to start making money right from the get-go, has put away as much money as the primary care doctor is able to over a 20-year period. Now let's take a look at these same numbers, but then let's add in the student loans that need to be repaid. So for a specialist, we take out her student loans using the uh, income-based repayment program. Her, her loans now take her down to 2.1 million. The primary care doc goes down to 1.3 million. And the UPS guy, of course, doesn't have any student loans, so he stays right where he was at 1.6. So in this scenario, the UPS guy is actually beating the primary care doc. Okay, now that's not the whole story. Let's add in the benefits. Let's assume that the primary care doc and the specialist are both self-employed. They're not getting any of the perks uh, that the UPS driver gets, uh, such as health care, retirement funding, etc. And so when you add those in, let's take a look. Specialist, primary care doc, yeah, UPS guy, look at that. He is now on par with the specialist. Now, hopefully I haven't crushed anybody's dreams yet. 
Um, and if I have, please hang in there because I'm about to start the next half of my presentation. And that is your best decision ever, or show your friends and family that you're not crazy. Okay, so remember that slide that I showed you earlier about lies and statistics? Well, I baited you a bit on these statistics. Um, what we did is we only looked at the last uh, 20 years out. What it, we really should be doing is looking further than 20 years out because chances are you're going to have uh, the ability to practice longer than 20 years. So let's take it up to just 30 years. Okay, so the specialist, and this is including the loan repayment, specialist goes out to 4.8 million, primary care 2.9 million, and the UPS guy 2.6 million. So that's not too bad. Now let's, just for this slide, I want, want you to remember those numbers that we're looking at there. I'm going to take the loans out. You see the specialist goes up to 5.1 million, primary care 3.2 million, and of course UPS guy, no student loans, so he stays the same at 2.6 million. Now, in both scenarios, with and without loans, the docs beat the UPS driver in earning potential. But there's something else that I want to point out, and that's how little of a bite those student loans that I made sound so terrible early on really take over a 30-year period. Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. Specialist, no loans, 5.1 million. With loans, 4.8 million. Really, over a 30-year period, that is not a huge difference. Primary care doc, 3.2 million. With loan repayment, 2.9 million. So the difference in earning is negligible over the long haul. Um, and the student loans are not as big of a concern as people make them out to be. So don't worry about the loans. Now let's look at something a little bit more existential if you don't mind. And that's what do you want to do with your life? This is what a UPS driver does all day, every day, for 30 years, or in this case 40. This is uh, Andy Garcia at uh, Abilene, Texas. Uh, who's been doing this for 40 years. Absolutely amazing. Now here's what a doc does all day, every day. They cure disease, they take care of patients, and in this case, apparently they do it uh, while looking fabulous. But it's not just the enjoyment of treating patients, it's the diversity you can have in medicine. So, oh, the places you'll go. There are so many specialties you can choose from. Everything from allergy and immunology all the way up to urology. And it seems overwhelming, and here's where I'm going to put a little plug in for the Student Doctor Network. Please take a look at our specialty selector, which we launched last year, studentdoctor.net. But even within every one of those specialties, you can do different things. You can do research, clinical practice, academics, volunteer work, and administration, or you can do a blending of those. Let's say you want to do more research and academics, you can do that. If you want to do all clinical practice, you can do that. Whatever you want to do, you can find a balance that you can enjoy. The other great thing about being a physician is there is a strong demand in job market. It's a great job market right now for physicians. And what does that mean? That means you don't have to be tied down to a single job or an employer. So if you're burnt out, you can go do something new. If you've got a bad boss, boring job, you can just get up and leave. And as a physician, I guarantee you will never hear, so what would you say you do here So in summary, yes, this is your worst decision. Dismal undergraduate completion rate, shorter time to practice medicine, there is a student loan burden, and you'll probably be as or even more financially successful in any field if you work as many hours and as hard as a physician does. But it's also your best decision. Physicians, frankly, have mentally stimulating jobs. They have a ton of career options. 
The job market is excellent. And student loan burden is really minor in the long run. And at the end of the day, I guarantee you will have made a real difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, uh, we'll go ahead and open this up for uh, questions and answers. Uh, please text your questions uh, to Laura Turner uh, via the questions window at the right.